Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for asking me to come and, and speak today. Um, I am going to be speaking, as you can see up there, on humoral kneeling. Um, the title I've been given is The Entry Point and Patient Positioning. And supposedly I've been picked to come here because I'm an expert. What is an expert? Um, Sam, the American Eagle there, looks like a very gruff expert. But when looking around, I think the best definition of an expert is somebody who's made enough mistakes that they know how to get out of a few. And I put myself very firmly in that group. So with regard to humoral nails, it's a lovely picture there. But I would say to you that humoral nailing is a Hansel and Gretel operation. And if any of you remember the story of Hansel and Gretel, the guys got stuck in the middle of a clearing in the middle of the night and couldn't find their way out. The first time it happened, they had stones in their pockets and they were able to follow their way out. The second time, the breadcrumbs had been, eating, had been eaten. And so the point of what I'm going to talk to you today about is simply a way so that you don't find yourself in that situation. So let's go back very simply to the start. Humoral anatomy and the important bits about it are that there's a wild amount of nerves and vessels that are going to get in your way and cause you problems. So if you're doing a humeral nail or you're doing a plate or you're doing any sort of surgery, like the golfers would say, tee up next to the hazard and play away from it. So what you want to do is know where the hazards are and play away from them. So what do I do? I put on my surface markings. I mark out my clavicle, I mark out my acromion, and I make my incision at the top end at about 45 degrees because it gives me a bit of play. Then what I do is I mark on the, on the arm where the auxiliary nerve, the radial nerve is posteriorly, and the radial nerve is distally, because those are the areas that I need a wee aid memoir just to keep me right. Because as I get older, I forget a lot of stuff, and I can get myself into trouble. With regard to the approach, small incision, but an incision that you can actually use and see things with. I then, under direct vision, will go down and go through. I will split the supraspinatus tendon because guddling around at the bottom of a deep dark hole and going through the foot plate is not cool. It's not cool for the shoulder, it's not cool after the event. So if you can actually make a small incision, you can see what you're doing, we're moving in the right direction. That allows you to plan your entry point. And for humeral nailing, I have found that an entry point just on the articular surface or the edge of the articular surface helps a lot. It keeps me out of trouble with the cuff, keeps me out of trouble with the tuberosity, and it helps me get down the medullary canal. The other big area that you need to have a think about is your distal locking. And there's two options for distal locking. You can either go from the front to the back or you can go from the back to the front. If you go from the front to the back, there's two big, big problems. Problem number one, there's a lot of structures there. There's a lot of guddling around and making sure vessels and nerves are out of the way. And the second big problem that you get when you go in from the front is you're trying to hit a moving target on the edge of a triangular bone. That ain't cool and it ain't easy. It's much easier to look and go posterior where you've got a flat surface, you don't have any structures, and you can keep away from things. So in an ideal world, you want to lock back to front rather than front to back. Classically positioning. The beach chair. That's what we're all sort of taught initially, and that's what we all use, and it's what shoulder surgeons love, and it's great. But underneath it is hate it. And they hate it because you've got a patient sitting up. There's blood pressure issues. There's risk of stroke. There's other problems there from them. They're a million miles away. You can't see what's going on. They're not near the airway with a big, big, long tube that seems to confuse them. 
I hate the beach chair. But I hate the beach chair because I feel very cramped in the situation. I feel it's difficult to get a good image at the bottom end. And particularly if I'm locking front to back, there's a, it's a moving target of a ridge. He doesn't know what they're at, pulling the arm out to the side and holding it. I'm aiming in the corner. I'm trying to hit a triangular bone. If I do have problems, it's a big issue trying to change that to do something with it. It is, however, your best option if you've got a dislocated shoulder along with things or you've got something you need to do in the shoulder at the glenoid. The other classic treatment position is the supine position, and I like it a bit better. Neath of us still don't really like it, because again, they're at the wrong end of the table, of big long tubes, but it does look after their blood pressure issues. I feel less cramped. I'm not hitting a moving target, because I can have the arm out and the arm board. So therefore, I've got a fixed point at which. But I still haven't taken away that problem that I have with nerves and vessels and a triangular bone. So after looking at that sort of stuff, I've really only one or two points to make to you guys. And this is how I try not to end up in that Hansel and Gretel position stuck in that forest glade, on my own, in the dark, in the middle of the night, and not having a clue what I'm supposed to be doing. The position that I have adopted for humeral nailing is a lateral position. And these of us love it, because they think they're doing hips, and they do hips all day long, and they're happy with that, and that's cool. They can sit up at the head, they can be closer to the airway, they can look after things. So they're really, really happy, and a happy anaesthetist is important. I like this position, and sorry for the picture on the left, um, because I managed to pick a table that I couldn't do it with, but I feel less cramped. And if you have a table, or a table reverse, so you can put the arc of the C arm underneath, you have plenty of view of the whole of the humerus, from the top to the bottom, it allows you to rest the arm on their side, so therefore you don't have a moving target. It allows you to do your locking back to front, so therefore you don't have to worry about your nerves and your vessels. And finally, if you do have a problem, you need to explore the radial nerve. If you do have a problem, you blow up the distal end when you're doing it, and I have done all those things. It allows you to actually roll the patient, put their arm out and over, and do a posterior approach. So finally, what I would say to you is that is how you stop getting in to the hole. And just in general terms, the advice that I can give you is when you are in that forest glade, when it's two o'clock in the morning, you're on your own, you don't know what you're doing, my advice is stop. Stop and work out a plan. Do not wander off. And if you remember the Hansel and Gretel surgery, or story, I was going to say surgery there. If you remember the Hansel and Gretel story, what's the problem with wandering off? The problem with wandering off is if you do see a house made of sweets when you do wander off, do yourself a favor. Keep walking. And keep walking because there's a witch that's always going to make things worse in there. So when you're stuck in that glade at night, stop, take a breather, make a plan. Try not to get in the glade in the first place. The last thing I want to say to you is I found an interesting set of pictures um, just before I came here. And it was, it was interesting because it describes the seven ages of an orthopedic surgeon and just in general life advice. Be careful if you're ever asked to be a lecturer at the BOA because it means one of one thing, because there's pictures that show what happens at various stages of orthopedic training. So you're ready for a consultant's job when you think of money, money, and money, and not sex, sex, and sex. But unfortunately, you're ready to be a lecturer when you're thinking of toilet twice as often as you think about money. So I'll leave you with that. 
and thanks very much.